But in the proper tradition, we'll um, start by running the VT titles. And you have to read the uh, clapperboard very carefully. I was too chicken to go on the top of that cherry picker more than once, but that was what buses looked like in 1986 in the center of, uh, of Chester. A bit of 35 mil film transferred to one inch video and finally ending up as um, an H.264 MPEG-4 video. It's been through more changes than, well, there's bound to be some more musical joke there, which I forget. I'm gonna talk, uh, starting off anyway, about the Doomsday Project. For those of you who don't know what the Doomsday Project was, it was a project by the BBC to celebrate the 800th anniversary of William the Conqueror's Doomsday Book. I say William the Conqueror, he was actually more popularly known as William the Bastard in England at the time, um, but not many people actually got away with calling him that, so he tended to be known as, uh, as the Conqueror. Uh, of course, the only date everybody knows, 1066, was when the Normans invaded. By 1086, tax money was needed, and consequently, you can't tax something until you've counted it. And so William sent out loads of commissioners all around at, at least the bit of England he was controlling because the Danes still controlled some bits. Actually, I can't quite remember whether the Danes controlled this part of Yorkshire, but certainly not much further north than here was still run by the Vikings. Um, to count everything, um, the king owned all the land, but who actually looked after it for him? Everything right down, as they said, to the last pig. The BBC decided, as well as doing some programs, there's nothing quite like an anniversary to get some programs past the people paying for them, uh, that um, we try and do something um, interactive. And so the Doomsday Project involved mostly school children writing about their, their local areas, taking photographs, not always school children, but mostly, because they're a lot easier to organize than the general public. Uh, that was one of the two video discs, and the other video disc was made up of information uh, from uh, of a more national nature, like um, information from the most recent uh, census, for example. But I'm going to go back a bit. What I said I'd talk about here was more to do with choices of technology than what the Doomsday Project itself actually did. Uh, but if you go to doomsday.org.uk, you'll find my rambly explanation of uh, quite a lot of things related to, uh, to this particular thing. Um, it started in 1984 with me and a few others ensconced in uh, an office uh, by Queen's Park Rangers football ground, but not in a position where you could actually see the play. You kind of could just see out, you couldn't see in. Uh, but uh, to go back a couple of years before that, I'd, be, I'd been producing music for the BBC, and then a previous boss asked me if I'd go and help him to set up BBC video, and um, I, I agreed because I felt like it was a time for change. as the Rolling Stones said in Sympathy for the Devil, and um, ended up uh, at the start of BBC Video. Now, the early 80s were an interesting time for, uh, for video, lots of completing formats. One of it was video discs, and I was quite interested in what you could do with the Philips LaserVision format, because I looked at the specification. I mean, video tapes were basically fairly crappy in terms of quality. They just about cut it, really. But when it worked well, um, the Philips video disc was very good. It also had one interesting feature. It had the bandwidth and the stability to handle teletext. And um, 1982, teletext was well established. Every new television set that you bought had teletext in it. So the idea was, let's put a teletext magazine on a video disc. If you play this through your TV and you've got a teletext decoder, you just watch it, watch the teletext like uh, you would with uh, any ordinary program. So we had subtitles, 
um, and we had loads of pages of information about the birds. So it was a fully interactive, in a sense anyway, um, thing that was bolted all together. Um, I took a BBC Micro, wrote a program to control the video disc. Uh, because it was divided up, you know, one section on each bird, this was the disc that lots of people experimenting with interactive video, usually with a BBC Micro and a Philips or Pioneer disc player, used. So we all had a go with it. I also then tried pulling the teletext information off the disc via a teletext decoder and incorporating that within the program. So by the end of this, there was this actually very flaky in technical terms, but once it worked, quite interesting um, piece of, uh, of kit. It was. Um, it wasn't, wasn't much smaller than that thing, actually, by the time we'd put the monitor and the disc player and the computer and everything else um, with it, and had to wheel it around. Um, and um, one day I got uh, a visit from a chap named Peter Armstrong, who was, was interested in uh, the idea of doing an interactive documentary. So we discussed what the video discs could do. Quickly gave up on the notion of doing a, a more conventional, if you like, interactive documentary because you basically only had about 50, 54 minutes of video on one side of the disc and uh, on one type of disc. There were two formats for this disc, one of which was you could still frame on and the other you couldn't. Uh, basically, for the techies, one where it had a constant angular velocity, like a gramophone record. There, there you could stop on a still frame or jump instantly to pretty well to any frame on the disc, well, instantly, within a couple of seconds. Um, or there was the long play version, which was just under an hour, but that had constant linear velocity, which ironically was one of the early formats of, uh, of gramophone record, but it never catch on, caught on because um, the pickup actually had to have a little wheel on it to drive the record round and uh, didn't work too well. Um, so, yeah, 54,000 frames or 36 minutes. Uh, Peter went away, as far as I can remember, came back the next day and said, right, we're going to have lots of still frames, lots of maps, lots of photos. What are we going to do about the data? Um, I, I, Peter says it wasn't exactly the next day and he'd been working on this for a long time, but I, I remember it as being, as being pretty instant. Just to give you an idea of, we can just forget about videotape for the moment, although videotape was used in interactive projects back then. Um, usually if you had quite a lot of patience to wait for it to spool backwards and forwards between the various sections. But uh, there are four types of um, video discs that were around. Um, Philips Pioneer Laser Vision Laser Disc with a K. Pioneer was Laser Disc. Philips was Laser Vision. They were actually completely compatible, exactly the same format. Um, and, and that, rather like C CD and DVD and all those other formats now, basically used uh, a little laser, an infrared laser, and um, read uh, the absence or presence of pits in a spiral on the discs. To go back a little bit, someone from Philips once told me that when Philips originally thought about the idea of putting video onto a disc, what they envisaged was a tiny little spiral of real visible frames. You know, like you'd taken, <laughs> you'd taken a film and you'd gone like this all the way around and put it onto the, the disc. And then they quickly realized that actually we don't need to do that, we can use television, uh, which, is, uh, which is what they, uh, what they did. So the Philips video disc, about which I know the most technically, used um, what's called pulse width modulation. This got all the journalists confused because pulse width modulation is an analog format, it's not a digital format. Basically, you have this waveform of the TV picture and you just chop it. And however long the chopped bits are, that is the length of the pits or the ground that you have on the disc. And then when you play that back, you filter it and you get the video out. It was apparently very simple to do, very susceptible to noise, but very stable and um, certainly in Europe, had a bandwidth of 5.25 megahertz, which was as good, if not better, than broadcast PAL television. Um, Thorny and I, just to give you the other, the, the, what the competition was and why it was, <laughs> we never got anywhere near being interactive. Um, the Thorny MI video high density system used a stylus. Now, nobody actually had used a stylus for video discs since Logie Baird in 
I think it was about 1928, with his 78s called Superior Radio Vision. Apparently there's one still in existence in Bradford at the museum. Uh, and you can play it back and you can see this 30, you know, 30 vertical line John Logie bed picture coming off it. No sound, of course. Maybe the sound was on the other side, I don't know. Um, but no, they actually had, it was, um, it's like a hill and dale system. So the, the groove was going up and down as it went, as it went around the disc. But, and this is the bit that really puzzled me, it was not possible to move the stylus fast enough because of its mass to follow the groove properly. So they assumed that the stylus was going to be kicked along by the, by the groove underneath it as you played it. Goodness knows how long the discs would last. Um, the ones I saw didn't last very long because they were actually quite thin and flimsy and the player had a clamp to clamp them in and before long someone would forget to put the, the disc in the right place, drop the clamp and cut a hole often right through the modulation on the disc. I, even the engineers at, at Thorn in Hayes did that, so uh, I, no, I don't think VHD ever made it to the public, to be honest. Okay, the one that did was the RCA Selector Vision. This was a bit more sophisticated. You, if you're old enough, you may well have seen these almost being given away with, uh, towards the end of its, uh, its life, loads of movies. That was a capacitance-based disc. Um, the other one that I find really interesting, which actually was used interactively but was never marketed in Europe, was McDonnell Douglas, the, uh, the airplane manufacturers, had this thing they called laser film, which was transmissive. You shine the laser through a transparent disc and read the information that was on it. Had the big advantage that you basically replicated it by developing it like a photograph, or perhaps more like an X-ray. I think may even use the same kind of stock. And, and that was used quite a bit in the States. Why McDonnell Douglas, you may ask. But actually, they, the airplane manufacturers had a big problem that if you bought a 747, the, the manuals, particularly for maintenance, would fill the whole wall of your office. So the idea of being able to manually handle all that information was quite attractive to them. And they poured loads of money into it. And they kept coming back, actually. I'd, Years, years later, I ended up having another meeting with them. Um, actually, it was from a company called General Dynamics, which I always kept thinking about. You know those Larry Niven Pearson puppeteers who have a company called General Products that make spaceships? I always thought General Dynamics was like that because General Dynamics are the people who make nuclear submarines, I found out later, for the American uh, military. So anyway, that, that was the other thing that was there. Philips Pioneer laser disc uh, tended to be the one that, that we used. And we used a BBC Micro. I suppose it's in the category of the bleeding obvious as to why we in the BBC were going to use a BBC Micro. But pretty well everybody else was doing that in, uh, in Europe. Um, in the States, they tended to use an Apple II. Um, but they were very limited because one important thing about uh, the BBC Micro was that, I suppose because it had input from broadcast engineers, its video output was specifically designed to work on an ordinary PAL television. Uh, which meant that with very little fiddling about, it was possible to combine it with, uh, with real video, uh, sometimes as an overlay, more often actually just by switching between the two, slightly dirtily, but it did, it did tend to work. Um, so interactive video was in fairly common use by the sort of, time we got to 1984. From the early 80s, um, initially in the States, there was a lot of interest, a um, lot of point-of-sale stuff. Mothercare produced video discs to tell people how to put up a baby buggy, because apparently this is an extremely complicated process and required an interactive system to tell you how to do it. Uh, my favorite was the, was the um, cardiac program where the user interface device was a dummy that you had to press on, and this doctor came up on the screen and told you whether you'd killed the patient or not. Um, so th that was... It's quite sort of um, straightforward. I've jumped, again. I've jumped ahead of myself slightly, haven't I? I'm talking about why using the micro. Hang on, I'll come back to this one in a moment. Um, so for use the micro, yes. PAL video timings, um, sophisticated programming, not just basic. There was also the option of having loads of other different uh, languages. As some of you may know, we ended up using a thing called BCPL, which um, is always called a precursor of C. Uh, which is it's sort of sort of is it's it's similar in a lot of ways to uh, to see lots of interfaces and expand expandability and had um, the booking uh, the backing of the computer literacy project 
Um, one important thing, just to put in the back of your mind about the computer literacy project, is at that point the government was subsidizing the cost of computer hardware in schools. Uh, okay, why not use a standard player? Um, well, I've already mentioned those, those first two. What we wanted to do, there just wasn't enough space on floppy disks. I mean, the idea in 1984 of, of having a hard drive attached to a home computer was actually nonsense. Even when, uh, when Acorn finally produced what they called a Winchester, um, I, think it, I think it had 10 megabytes of storage and cost several thousand pounds just by itself. So that was, that was no good. Um, but more particularly, we wanted to have a single disk solution. You have this piece of kit, you put one disk on, you press go, and it happens. And the final thing was all to do with full frame teletext, because my initial thought had been to store all the, of the information on the disk by filling the frames with teletext, which it's technically possible to do. And uh, the University of London Audiovisual Centre actually did make a disk to test, uh, to test this out. Um, we were concerned about it being rather unstable, um, particularly error correction. Broadcast teletext works on the assumption uh, that you rotate the carousel every minute or so, or every half minute, and if you get a glitch, you know, if you get a word wrong uh, in the text, it'll just, next time around, it'll get corrected, and it's no big deal. Um, for telesoftware, you ended up having to put in a lot more error correction. And what we were finding was, and you run the numbers, the actual amount of data that you could store was dropping down every time you made it more and more rugged, as, as you might expect. Uh, Philips came up with a great idea to, to get around that, which I'll come back to in a moment. So forget that, because we've said it. OK, full frame teletext. Now, the, in that pulse width modulated signal on the video disk, you had a left and right audio carrier and a video carrier. And up here was 5.25 megahertz. And uh, that wasn't, that wasn't going to work. Uh, before we'd kind of figured out how we might deal with it, Philips came up with an interesting idea. Replace those audio carriers with a data carrier. Um, now, I have to remind you when, when this is. This is. Uh, this is back in 1984, actually going on 1985 by now. And there had been a start on, the, on, on CD-ROM, by which I mean the, the physical carrier medium had been defined. Uh, Philips and also Sony, it's interesting actually, on video disc tended to be Pioneer and Philips, CD tended to be Sony and Philips. It's all to do with who owns the patents for what. And. Um, this, this idea was you have a channel which basically has the same kind of low-level format as Philips were putting into this new CD-ROM format, which was an error-protected an error version of what was already on CD-audio. There's a lot of funny things going on on CD, um, CD-audio. A lot of people think that CDs consists of uh, land and pits that are noughts and ones, but it's much more complicated than that and has things like 8 to 14 modulation and stuff. And I, I won't go into that because I don't know enough about it. Uh, but basically, we were then told, OK, you can have this, uh, this data channel. And you can have 3.5 kilobytes of error-corrected data per frame of the video disk. And what was more useful, actually, even than that, was that you don't lose the video. So you've got all this video, all these 55,000 frames per side. You could still use all of those. Uh, or you can have a mixture, which in the end is what we did. We had some video that had, had audio, and then we had some still frames that were, uh, instead of audio, had all this data sitting underneath them. And as I say, we didn't use um, CD-ROM because it was coming in quite late. There wasn't even a standardized filing system till 1986, when a, a bunch of engineers got together in a hotel uh, at a resort called High Sierra and came up with the High Sierra format, which eventually, and that took another year or so, evolved into ISO 9660. And if you've been doing all this stuff long enough, you'll get a headache every time somebody says ISO 9660 to you. It's kind of one of those things. It's like when I did engineering drawing, I always used to get a British standard quoted at me, and thank goodness I've forgotten its number. It's a kind of, it's a mantra, you know? Um, CD-ROM would have absolutely no scope for video whatsoever. 
there wasn't enough data. And at that time, long time before even JPEG, the best you could hope for were 8-bit adaptive palette images. And on a single CD-ROM, you'd get 2,200 of them. And we wanted at least 10 times that. So fortunately, that wasn't going to work for us. But it's still, you know, it's still steam power back, uh, back then. Getting information from the schools involved posting out uh, floppy disks. Actually, I was going to bring one with me because I found one. Um, but then I thought, no, you, you guys, you probably do know what a floppy disk looks like. Um, apparently, those. I'm interested. Oh, you're going to ask me if they're hard or soft sector next, aren't you? Um, no, they were five and a quarter inch um, soft sector. Actually, I don't think they ever had hard sector five and a quarter. Um, did you know three and a half inch um, so called floppy disks are in South Africa are apparently colloquially known as stiffies? Um, however, no, five and, a, five and a quarter inch. So you basically, it had a, a BBC Micro um, or a Research Machines program on this, on this disk for data gathering, post them out to the schools, schools fill in the information, post them, uh, post them back. Um, there's no graphic user interface uh, in common use at all. Um, one of my favorite little stories from the early days was we got, we got some locals in, in Ealing to uh, try out um, a mouse on the BBC Micro because that was quite easy to program. You just look for the interrupts from the mouse and move a pointer around on the screen. And I'd written the program to do that because everybody did. Uh, and um, we're trying out, you know, watching people using the bird book stuff and various other pieces of software. And my favorite was the, was the man who was, was using, the, using the mouse for whatever it was he was doing, and it came down the screen. And when, it, when he reached the bottom before the pointer did, he did that. <laughs> and I can't blame him. I you know, confront him with this strange, strange thing. Um, I mentioned press space bar for next page, because if you're old enough, you'll remember the, the tyranny of that. When they launched the BBC Micro, um, they got, um, oh, actually, I've forgotten which poet it was. It's the guy from Liverpool. They got him to write a poem where the, uh, the last line of every verse was, now press return. And that would then take you on to the next verse of the, uh, of the poem. Um, the equipment that was used for getting, uh, getting the maps and uh, all the slides, we asked people to send in slides, uh, was analog, of course. It was a Telecine slide scanner, a Rank Centel Mark III, if you care about it. Um, an analog Rostrum camera, which was basically you just, you just wouldn't believe the size and weight of this bloody thing. It's like, well, it was a bit, bit like that again. Only this is, this is mounted up on a vertical rostrum pointing down. And you're underneath it moving these things around with this half a ton hanging, hanging above you. Um, I didn't realize until much later I came to start working with digitized versions of the maps just how irregular the uh, scan of the camera was. You're pre presenting it with an ordnance survey map, which has a nice, nice grid on it. And when you actually look at it, the detail, you find they're all kind of just shifted all over, all over the place. Um, fortunately, it was at least consistent between shots, although it did change. Because, of course, as they warm up, the, the um, geometry of the image changes slightly. So, And um, we, we still had some fun. I was going to talk about a, a, a couple of um, things that, uh, that we did. Um, I've mentioned the maps. Dr. Mo Martin Porter, who is famous for a really good open source algorithm uh, for parsing English and a few other languages as well. If you're ever into dealing with user interface and need a parsing algorithm, look up the Porter algorithm because it's very easy to implement and he, he gives it away. He, he devised the algorithms f to enable the moving around and zooming in and out of maps. And also when we decided we were going to uh, do something with um, uh, what we were calling surrogate walks, he, uh, uh, he came up with a mechanism for that. Um, but what, what am I talking about? We call them surrogate walks. This is a bit like Google Street View. And the idea was you go around somewhere and you stop at various places and in our case take eight photographs in a circle. And then there's an algorithm to allow you to follow that on the screen as you do. Uh, we'd pinch the idea, of course. I'll come back to where from in a moment had to try and invent a couple of things. One of the ways you could actually walk to the walks from inside a gallery. So if you came through that door and turned around, you kind of saw TARDIS-like your way back in. Um, at one, one point, once you've come out, you turned. With, this is a, a standard thing. You turned left to find some information. Um, 
lifts was my favorite one. I had to go up and down in a towel block. So the idea was you walked, you walked into the lift and then you turned around. And as you turned around, you went up. So then you walked out. And then if you, when you're up there and you walk into the lift and then turn around, it's taken you back down again to try and work. These things actually seem to work, um, seem to work uh, quite well. Um, this is the, the inside of, uh, sorry, the, uh, something like the market square almost of Brecon. And this is one particular set of eight photos that worked reasonably well when I tried to put them together into a continuous circle. Most of the time, they don't. So I have a great deal of respect for Google managing to uh, do it, but they did spend a lot more money on their camera equipment than, uh, than we did. Um, part of it, of course, is that the aspect ratio of a standard 35 mil still frame is a bit wider than uh, television 4x3. And I think we've, we didn't quite click to that, which is why you tend to lose bits off the edge. But that's what it was made of. If, if you ever get the chance to walk around back and keep an eye open for a bloke in a flat cap who looks a bit like Benny Hill. He crops up all over the place. He followed us around. <laughs> and there's about four or five occasions when you see him walking down the street grinning at us. Don't mind, it's all, uh, all quite um, good fun. And where did we get this idea from? If you haven't seen this, have a look. It's early 1970s, the uh, architecture machine group at um, MIT, the Media Lab. Um, they, were, they were asked by the American military to come up with a system to enable soldiers to practice invading somewhere. Um, and so they decided they'd invade Aspen, Colorado. I think it's probably a good place for a holiday. And they basically mounted, it, this was actually a bit Google Street View like, they mounted several cameras on the top of a car and they drove down the middle of every street in Aspen, Colorado. Uh, and that's what we saw. We wanted to try and see how we could emulate it. Their system used either eight or 16 video discs so that when you got to a junction in one direction, the system with the computer that was driving it would, would then um, move other disks to the frames that you would get if you went off down the other directions. Um, you can find it on, the, uh, on YouTube. It's worth a, worth a look. Um, the other thing we did that was quite fun um, it turns up in this little bit of computer graphics. Uh, and, and yes, the in-joke, which you may have noticed, is that is a real teapot in a computer-generated gallery. Um, sorry, the ones, you, the ones who were laughing obviously do computer graphics. For the rest, a teapot is what you always render to practice. Um, that was done on a Bosch FGS 4000, a piece of kit that, that cost as much as a large car, never mind a small car, and was probably much less powerful than my mobile phone. And um, I spent several weeks with a guy doing that. The shape of the gallery is designed to minimize the number of images on easels that can be seen from any one point. Because if you ask it to render too many, it just falls over. Um, that idea, and actually the company who did it, we got from Mike Oldfield. If you, if you um, YouTube, I think it's called Pictures in the Dark. There's a video. And there's a, whole, uh, there's a whole chunk of stuff where they wander around a, um, bits of a house and go down a corridor and stuff. And that was what we saw and thought, ah, oh, maybe that will solve our problem for, uh, for this. So um, Mike put us in touch with the company in Soho who did it, and uh, we, we used them. And the Doomsday Gallery was a way of exploring a way into the information other than the basic um, search mechanism, free text, or, or following a, a hierarchy. Uh, with this. Um, in the end, we only used it mostly for uh, the photo sets, so you walk around different sections of the gallery covering different parts of culture and science and, uh, and things. Um, but also, you can get at some of the textual information, high-level uh, overlooks at Brit British economy and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, I'd originally thought, well, you know, how could we build a hierarchy to have the entire information, something that was maybe like a, a space station that you wandered around and you came in at the entrance and you went and looked at things. And this started out seeming to be quite 
quite reasonable to do, but the big problem is, uh, and this is what happens when you look at hierarchies, the ground floor is almost empty. It's only, well, this is on the assumption you start at the ground floor and work up. As you go further up, you get more information until when you get to the top, that's where the real stuff is. So, in fact, as a mechanism for accessing information, it's a bit restrictive. I think I called it the landscape of knowledge. This idea of going into a space and wandering around it works beautifully, if you like, for a flat file kind of thing. Uh, and you can extend from, uh, from there. So you could, you could go into a hospital and then find out things of that, of that kind. But trying to put too much, uh, too much hierarchy into the basic landscape just unfortunately doesn't really seem, uh, seem to work. Okay, what I was going to do was just look at uh, briefly a few things that um, we've been accused of, uh, of um, inventing. Uh, and then immediately shot down. We didn't really invent anything. We just came up with the things that we found with the help of uh, a lot of other people. But um, certainly outside of a few university projects, at this point, we were one of the first uh, organizations to try things like interactive mapping, different ways of data display. Uh, for example, there are bar charts where when you change parameters, the bars actually move as you change the parameters. Um, there was a lot of, oh, I think we can try that, and if it works, let's put it in. Uh, but we had nothing really to go on at that particular point. We, we were crowdsourcing, <laughs> albeit using the Royal Mail, um, to the, the, the children and others who were writing their 20 pages, teletext-sized pages about their daily lives or, or the towns they were. They essentially, they were like blogging. Um, the walks were a bit like Street View. The photo sets that uh, we have and the photo competition that we ran to get material in from the, uh, from the public as well as what went with their pages, they're a bit like Flickr and, in and Instagram. The main things that we lacked, uh, obviously having the internet instead of having to use the mail would have been, would have been wonderful. Um, probably have found by the time we got round to thinking about it and had, the th had probably the third meeting, someone in California would have already done it and and uh, made a million dollars from it. Um, instant digital phot photography would be great. Also, the, the ease with which you can keep the quality high with digital media is great. I had a big problem with the surrogate walks, um, which started life on, as 35 mil stills and had to be transferred into something, in other words, what they call eight to four perf translation. They had to be optically printed onto the movie 35 mil, which is the opposite way around we lost quite a lot of quality. And if it was digital, you just don't run into those problems. <coughs> Wouldn't have had the storage problems. It's not just a question of using the internet to get the stuff in. We could distribute the thing on the internet, use a browser. There's now, and I'm, I'm really hoping that we're gonna get a bit of stability because over time, so much in, in, in interactive media has changed. Every time we think, oh, this is what we want to aim for, then it then it changes, something else happens. And it, in the hardware age, which I went through, blood, sweat, tears, up with things like CDI, the CD, you know, CD-ROMs themselves and stuff, we've now moved into a software age. And the, the price of entry has dropped. People are much more collaborative. The kind of things, op not just open source hardware, open source software, the kind of things that people will now work together on around the world almost without thinking. All these kind of things would make stuff uh, so much easier to do, and we could we could keep updating it. Well, we, you know, we, it, it, okay, that's the thing I missed. Wiki, in a sense, as soon as you start updating it, it potentially becomes a wiki. Um, ironically, the big reason why there was not a second Doomsday project was um, Ordnance Survey wanting three thousand pounds per map in royalties um, once the original project was out. This is because the gas board would pay them three thousand pounds a map for a video disc that showed where the gas pipes were for the one video, <laughs> um, us to try. We did, you know, we did start the process of coming up with, um, with future ones, but we didn't, uh, didn't manage that. Um, kind of trying, trying to stop it disappearing. It's in not too bad a state at the moment, but you still can't look at all of it. This was the, um, the piece, as the Observer said it, when, um, uh, when Lloyd Grossman held up a video, a doomsday disc, and said, this is an example of digital obsolescence which is ironic, of course, because um, half of the project is analog. Um, the Chameleon Project, which was the universities of Leeds and Michigan, they used um, emulation. They basically used uh, an, an extension of the BBEM 
emulator, which some of you may know. Uh, they expanded that with the help of the guy who wrote it, and um, they had a system where you could actually run the whole thing as it had looked originally. Um, I had an argument with them, though, because they took the video frames off the video disc, noise as, and all. They looked horrible. And they said, we want to recreate the user experience. And I said, that is absolute nonsense. You want, you want to recreate where, where material is available in a better quality. You want the better quality one. Otherwise, it all gets lost. We ended up begging to differ, but I got the National Archives to pay me to do the video side of it properly. The thing that they didn't quite realize at um, Chameleon, no matter how many times I told them, that by taking the video disc and still framing it and grabbing the frame, they were losing two megahertz of the bandwidth of the picture anyway because the doomsday players were specially designed to enable you to get the full five megahertz image off. And you can imagine, actually, that, that two megahertz at the top, that's two megahertz out of five is missing. It's a lot of, a lot of detail. So the National Archives, because Peter Armstrong gave them a copy, they were obliged to preserve it. It's quite a nice wheeze, actually. They're obliged by law to preserve artifacts in their possession. Um, so uh, they asked me to, to do it. So with a lot of help from BBC Research, we got some high quality dubs from what was closest and left of the original master tapes. So there now, there's copies of those in the BBC and at the National Archives. Um, a guy named Adrian Pierce, who is sadly now dead, of his own volition, rewrote a PC interface for the whole thing and did an absolutely gorgeous job. It was online for a while. Um, people, every, everybody just kind of forgot about any possible copyright problems because he did such a nice job. Then a poor guy got cancer and died within a couple of weeks. And that just, that just went. I think there's a group of people who could figure out how to get around his copy protection. It's another thing to bear in mind, by the way. Don't let your developers copy protect things without telling you how to get into it. And the final one really is 2011, 25th anniversary. The BBC decided they'd, um, they'd put it back online and asked the members of the public to update photos and text about the places where they lived. And that you can still find if you go to bbc.co.uk slash doomsday. I hate it. Don't you hate it when these people on television say forward slash? I kind of think, what sort of person are you? Forward slash? You're not going to use a backslash, surely. That's, you know, that's an escape character. OK, where was I? bbc.co.uk, es yes, escape from windows. bbc.co.uk slash doomsday. It's still there. You can explore it. I don't know how long it'll be there, but it was there a couple of days ago. And all I wanted to do then is to show that that's the motley crew who kind of ran it all at the end in a place called Bilton House in, in um, Ealing, in West Ealing, in fact. And that's my younger brother over there on the left. Um, I'm, uh, oh, very important person. I've mentioned Peter Armstrong, but this man, Roger Kelly, was a project engineer in the BBC, and he project managed the Doomsday Project, which was actually the most difficult job, because originally they wanted to me to do it, me to do it, and some senior engineer said, we can't have him doing that, he's not an, he's not an engineer. Um, and actually, I was delighted, because managing a project of that size, Roger had just the right temperament to shout at everybody until only he was blue in the face, but they got the job done. And thank you, Roger. He's still around somewhere. He doesn't, you know, he lives down south, but um, he does get a bit overlooked because I tend to do some presentations and Peter always gets the headline, but no, Roger's uh, uh, another guy. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for listening. That's, um, that's the lesson for this afternoon. I'm happy to discuss questions or whatever. Do we have time for a few now or do you want to? Overdrinks. Even better, especially if I'm having a drink. Thank you very much.